with Dr. Deborah ba Bradley. And uh, it's all about what this song is rated. I love that title. I think that's hilarious. Oh, sorry, it was this hymn. The hymn is racist, developing an anti-racist music ministry, something we all strive for. Dr. Deborah uh, has been a lifelong church musician. She played for Wednesday prayer and Sunday night church services throughout her childhood in Knoxville, Tennessee. Do you still have the accent? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, she does. Okay, I love it. Um, she has served as director of music for several Toronto area churches. She retired from music ministry in 2014, but remains active as an organist and a choir member. She joined the Islington United Congregation in 2020. Lucky them. Deb holds both a Bachelor of Music and Master of Music in Music Education from the University of Toronto and a PhD in Sociology and Equity Studies in uh, Education. I almost said Edmonton. Not the same at all. <laughs> Newly retired from the University of Toronto and the University of Wisconsin-Madison, she continues her work in anti-racism and trauma studies. As a music minister and educator, she embeds the principles of anti-racist ped pedagogy. pedagogy. See, I've got her saying it wrong too. <laughs> pedagogy into her work with choirs, con oh man, it's the end of the day, congregations, and in the classroom. She is the author of many publications exploring how music education can enact and support anti-racist initiatives for uh, teams of all ages. Teams? Okay. Uh, including two recent articles in The Gathering, and she edits the journal Action, Criticism, and Theory for Music Educators. Uh, more recently edited the book Trauma and Resistance, Music Educator, Haunted Melodies, was published by Rutledge. And here we have Dr. Deb Bradley. Thank you. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, my voice is a little worse for the wear at this point in the day. I'm just getting over laryngitis, so please bear with me. Anyway, it's really great to see you all here. And during the next hour, I hope we can explore some important concerns for us as musicians in the United Church of Canada relating to planning and implementing an anti-racist music ministry. I'm going to focus on two particular questions that arise when we do this work. One is, why should a music ministry be anti-racist? And secondly, what might that look like. So in other words, how can we begin to enact an anti-racist music ministry in your congregation? Or how can you take that work further uh, from perhaps where you are? What are the things we need to consider when we're doing this work? I encourage you to think about your own situation, your own congregation, be it big, small, well-resourced, not well-resourced, um, so that we can engage together in thinking through why an anti-racist music ministry might be a necessary step for us to take. And I hope we can raise some questions in our discussion period as well to think about what, where your congregation is on this path and how we can share ideas and work together and work within our own settings to further this important work. So I want to begin by clarifying a few terms. I'm sure most of you are well aware of what these things mean, but just for clarity in this particular discussion. Um, our first term is racism, and you hear it a lot, but what does it mean in this context? It goes beyond individual biases. It refers to the systems and the structures that produce material effects that disadvantage people of color and benefit white people. Next term that we'll 
here is white supremacy. Oh, I'm ahead of myself. White supremacy is the belief that white people constitute a superior race and should therefore dominate society to the exclusion or detriment of other racial and ethnic groups. White supremacy is the sometimes unacknowledged system through which racism is operationalized in systems and institutions. And finally, when I use the term anti-racism, I draw from Professor George Day's definition. Anti-racism is an action-oriented, educational, and political strategy for institutional and systemic change that addresses the issues of racism and the interlocking systems of social oppression, including sexism, classism, heterosexism, ableism, and that list can be extended as may be appropriate. Language bias is also part of that. So why should musicians in, or music ministries in the United Church of Canada become anti-racist? Well, of course, the easy answer to this is that the United Church has set this as a priority. Um, they have declared their intent to become anti-racist. And therefore, as worship leaders in this setting, we have a role to play in fulfilling that goal. The church made this commitment after the general council meeting of 2018, when those who were gathered heard the stories of pain and racial exclusion shared by many black, indigenous, and people of color who were in attendance at the meeting. So in June 2020, a proposal was made to general council to become an anti-racist denomination. Okay, why is this not moving? There. An anti-racist denomination is one that actively works at dismantling racism and white supremacy at all levels of the church and continues to work at decolonizing its theology and strives to redistribute racial power more fairly. It does this anti-racism work so that people of all racial backgrounds can participate in the church's life fully and freely. There is a need to make becoming an anti-racist denomination a missional priority at all levels of the denomination. Now, of course, this policy wasn't created out of a vacuum, and there is support in the Bible for anti-racism and here are just a few examples, and I'll just let you read those. Um, from Romans 10, 12, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. And from Acts, Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality. And 1 Corinthians 12, 13, in the same way, all of us, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether slaves or free, have been baptized into the one body by the same spirit, and we have all been given the one spirit to drink. So I'm going to summarize that really quickly. General Counsel identified three primary goals for anti-racism that affect all aspects of life and work in the church, dismantling white supremacy and racism, decolonizing theology, and redistributing racial power. Now this is a three-pronged approach that applies directly to music ministry. None of these areas can be achieved easily. In other words, what we're talking about is not a to-do list, so that if accomplished, you're good all taken care of. The tendrils of racism and colonialism are deeply entrenched in Christianity and within the United Church itself. So if you came here today hoping to walk away with a short little to-do list of things you could do, I'm afraid you're going to leave disappointed. But I hope that we can think through some things that we can take immediate action on and talk about why it might be important to take these actions and in that process, embrace the necessity for doing so. 
How do we go about making our worship music such that people from all racial backgrounds can participate in the church, church's life fully and freely? In other words, how do we go about dismantling white supremacy through music ministry? And how do we make that a priority in our worship planning? And this is really a, a crucial question. So let's begin by thinking about why we might want to prioritize it. Think for a moment, please, about the following questions in the context of your own situation. What is the overall message of the worship music your congregation experiences week after week? Is it musically, music that's heavily skewed toward the music of white men? Does it draw predominantly from one genre or style of music? Now, I know many of you have been very intentional about including music from cultures that are not from European heritage, and you've made space for music from formerly colonized regions of the world and peoples who have been oppressed, and that's wonderful, that's good, that you're a couple of steps down the path. Um, <clears throat> But it's also a question of balance. How often do you include that music? And when? Is it mostly to tie into special days or times of recognition, such as Black History Month? Is there more that you could do? My guess is probably on some level, every single one of us in here can answer yes, there's more we could do. And I say that knowing that worship planning is not simply a fill-in-the-blank exercise. You pick one from column A, one from column B, one for down here. Okay, we're good, that's it. Um, there are many factors that must be considered every week in order to create the conditions for meaningful worship. Dismantling white supremacy in worship through music isn't easy. So what do we do to help people feel that they are welcome in our midst, for all people to feel welcome. This is what we're going to talk about next. Okay. How we like to music is who we are. I'm just going to let that sit there for a moment. The short, simple sentence packs a punch stating in very direct and clear terms a complex concept, performativity. Now, when I use the word performativity, I use it in the sense explained by J.L. Austin back in the 1950s. It's a statement that does what it says. So an example of a performative statement is when a minister says, I pronounce you husband and wife. That actual statement is the legal requirement for the marriage. Uh, another example would be if a judge says, I sentence you to five years in the penitentiary. That's the sentence. So uh, a performative utterance actually does what it says it does. And that comes out of speech act theory. Um, but it not only describes a given reality, it also changes the social reality that it describes. Okay, I'll let that sit for a moment. So in 1990, Judith Butler famously applied this concept to gender in her book, Gender Trouble. She argued that gender itself is performative. And Butler described gender as an expectation that ends up producing the very phenomenon that it anticipates. Now, when Butler wrote this in 1990, she was still, in many ways, thinking binarily. So lots of her examples were we wrap baby girls in pink and little boys in blue, and that trains them to become, you know, girls or boys or whatever, you know. Um, so that understanding of performativity is, is actually the one that I'm working with here in music. I don't want it confused with the popular vernacular use for the term performativity. 
um, which connotes that something performative is, is fake or it's being done just for show, right? Just to make yourself look good. Um, but that comes into play a little later, so I just hope we have that distinction between the two uses of the term. So, music. In the late 1990s, South African sociologist Christopher Small drew upon this concept of performativity as something that changes the social reality in which it operates in his brilliant analysis of what goes on during a classical music concert. In his book, Musicking, The Meanings of Performance and Listening, Small concluded that how we like to music is who we are. He described in stunning detail throughout the book the various types of relationships that are developed or are at work when we enter a space where music is performed. Relationships exist between the musicians who are making the music, between the musicians and the audience, the audience and the musicians, and between the members of the audience. These relationships can include behavioral expectations, such as applause or restraint from applause in between movements of a symphony. Uh, it could be raising of hands during song in worship. Uh, exclamations such as amen and hallelujah, as well as improvisational solo moments for musicians. And don't get upset, I'm not referring to worship as a performance. Uh, Christopher Small did make it, um, he did acknowledge that wherever music takes place, these relationships also develop. And those may be worship settings or rituals uh, that might be going on, etc. So it, the concept could be expanded into worship very easily. In our context today, though, let's just confine our thoughts to worship music regardless of whether it's made by a choir, a praise band, the congregation with or without some sort of direct musical leadership. And it, in other words, whenever we get together in church, we call upon, create, and further develop relationships. So it's really crucial to ensure that the relationships created in worship settings enable everyone who enters the space to participate fully and freely without exclusion and without feeling that they've been othered. In the case of music ministries, if we operate as Judith Butler suggested about gender with an expectation that our efforts are anti-racist, well, that should produce the phenomenon of anti-racism, right? What do you think? Hands up if you think that's the case. Oh, you're all so smart. Okay. <laughs> While that outcome sounds quite straightforward and wonderful, unfortunately, it's not that simple. As church musicians, we work in tricky space because we, how we like to music can very easily fall back on theologies of our childhood, and those theologies are rooted in colonial histories, white supremacist ideologies, and our own acknowledged and unacknowledged biases. Now, sociologists and psychologists have long recognized that music serves as a marker of identity. Humans use music to construct their sense of self. We use it to regulate our emotions and to present ourselves to the world through the music with which we engage. So take a moment to think about the music that you personally enjoy the most. What are your top 10 favorite songs or pieces of music? Is, it, is that music, those top 10, are they all from the same genre? Or are they diverse? What do your selections say about you as an individual? What do they say about you culturally? Okay, let's think for a moment now about music in your church setting. What are your congregation's top 10 favorite hymns or songs? 
Do they represent a mix of music from, say, Voices United and More Voices? And sometimes augmented with uh, 10,000 Reasons or Shout to the Lord or some other song, song from another resource? Maybe your congregation uses CCLI predominantly. Do you love, does your congregation love the old songs? How do you go about choosing music for any given worship service? If you were to make a list of the primary concerns when you're planning worship music, I guess most of you would come up with a list that'll look something like this. You may have other items, but I bet all of you have these items. You worry about the liturgical season. You worry about the theme of the day or what the sermon topic might be. How much new music dare we throw at these people this morning? You know? And how much time do we have? Do I have time to teach something new? Or is this hymn got seven verses and we can't delete any of them because they all speak directly to the message of the day? Okay, if, but if we let these be our only considerations for selecting worship music without making space for the performative aspect of music that is anti-racist, we maintain status quo. If we rely solely on the congregation's hundred best-known hymns, we're denying them an opportunity for growth both in their musical and theological thinking, and we're probably reiterating week after week ideas of colonialism, empire, and white supremacy. In addition, we might be infusing our congregations with nationalist propaganda and simultaneously normalizing militarism. So now I'm sure you're thinking, oh, no, that's not good. We don't want to do that. No, we don't. But I want us to think even a little bit more deeply about how our worship music repertoire can influence the way we think and behave in the world and how it can be performative and actually do what it says. Music is powerful precisely because it is performative. When we engage with music, the vibrations of sound actually enter our bodies. And when we become fully engaged with that music, we sometimes reach what psychologist Mikai Csikszentmihalyi identified as flow. And sometimes we'll, you'll feel a flow experience in Teze music with the repetition, or in certain praise choruses, with the number of repetitions. Okay. Uh, so during a flow experience, absolutely nothing else matters but being in that moment. And we actually forget about the specifics of what we're doing, right? So we, in some ways, shut off our brain just to feel the experience, right, and go with it. When flow occur occurs in a group setting, we align with each other through the music because music creates an intimate solidarity that in worship settings, we attribute to the Holy Spirit in our midst. We may not be conscious of this alignment though, but in the process, making music together with others can foster emotional bonding, arouse shared feelings of identity, <clears throat> arousing shared feelings of identity. And because music is deeply related to our childhood experiences and our family traditions, it is also deeply rooted in our sense of self and belonging. Now, Brian Caruana argues that religious experiences draw upon spiritual technologies that can create and augment that strong sense of us but unfortunately, it is almost impossible to create a sense of us without at the same time creating them. 
And this is a really difficult paradox to work through because it confronts us every time we begin to feel that sense of belonging. Genres of music can become a badge of identity. For example, classical music is often associated with certain economic standing in the world. Country music is often associated uh, also in a negative sense at times. Um, and so, you know, you can think about any genre and you, you'll pull to mind an image of the people who make that music, right? This understanding isn't new. Since the 1800s, nations have drawn upon music's power to develop a sense of patriotism and national identity. Patriotism and national identity can create feelings of belonging to something bigger than ourselves. And they are powerful elixirs. Just think about the way you might feel if you're watching a playoff hockey game. Let's pick the Canadian juniors because they usually make it to the end. Anyway, not the Maple Leafs. Uh, but how do you feel when you know, a Canadian team is playing another country and they play the Canadian national anthem? How do you feel when the crowd starts to sing? Think about how you feel if you're there in the crowd at the stadium when people start singing. I mean, that's a feeling, right? It's very potent. Okay. Hymnists, likewise, were influenced by this perceived need to express their national identities musically. And nearly every nation that identifies as Christian has a repertoire of hymns that put forward notions of how God has blessed their people, usually above others, and provided abundant resources, was on their side during time of crisis, etc. Canada had its own flurry of patriotic songwriting in the late 1800s through the earliest 20, early 20th century. But most of these weren't hymns for worship use, thankfully, I think. Okay. However, our hymn repertoire has been strongly influenced from two primary sources, Great Britain and the U.S. And both countries have a wealth of patriotic hymnary that's colored by colonialism. So although in Voices United, many of the original texts of these types of hymns were replaced or altered to some degree to minimize their nationalistic and colonialistic implications, these familiar tunes still exist and we still sing them. And when we do, they often call to mind the original texts for many people. At the moment, I'm thinking of the tune Jerusalem, which in its original form drew on William Blake's text to intimate that and I'm quoting here, England is the new chosen nation where the new Jerusalem that would refer to the kingdom of God on earth would be built. That's from Ten Singh in 2017. Now, those te that text was replaced in Voices United with Car Carl Daw's beautiful de text, O Day of Peace, which I personally really enjoy singing. But I can't even count the number of times a congregation member has come up to me after a service where we've sung O Day of Peace to ask if, can we sometimes sing Jerusalem with the original words? And I wonder, in part, if that is because the text of O Day of Peace actually points to some of the same images. They've been reworked, right? But you see, did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? O day of peace that dimly shines through all our hopes and dreams. And this one, I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand. Carl Dawes version, may swords of hate fall from our hands, our hearts from envy find release, but it's still the mental fight, right? and the sword image. So my point here is that the tune doesn't exist alone in people's minds. For many, it is always and forever associated with that William Blake text, which glorified Imperial Great Britain and is full of militaristic images. 
Because people have long memories of tune and text association, our efforts to replace such texts needs to be ongoing and will probably take several generations before we forget about William Blake's text. Now, Carrie Connolly has written that nationalistic and colonial hymns seemingly align a country with God's abundance and blessing and often acknowledge prosperity without acknowledging communal sin, ignore the victims of our wrongdoings and fail to acknowledge the enslaved, the marginalized, and the hurting, and assume a special place in God's heart for our country over others, which increases the potential for xenophobia and anti-immigrant sentiment. In settler colonial countries like Canada, the cultivation of national identity often upheld white supremacy. In fact, I'd say it always upheld white supremacy. As a colony of Great Britain, Canadian national identity was constructed as a white identity. This Canadian white identity required the denigration of indigenous peoples, and this was necessary to justify the removal of indigenous peoples from their land so that the land could be appropriated by settlers and the resources within that land appropriated by corporations and government. Eventually, the belief in white supremacy supported the cultural genocide that was carried out through residential schools, where the United Church of Canada, unfortunately, was complicit. Those of us who make music in the church are well aware of music's power. We've established that quite well today, I think. And we've probably all had experiences that not only have touched us deeply, but have also influenced our decisions to do this work in the church through music. If you're like me, music is the means through which I feel most connected to God. But are we really aware of what potent tool we have at our disposal for both the good and the bad that it can do? Is there a way for us to tap into music's ability to create a strong sense of us that doesn't at the same time create a them? Can we find a way to make our worship music recognize, represent, honor, and include all of God's people? Can we find ways to work against the ingrained biases that our past musical entrainments have instilled to work against the biases that have been supported through our church affiliations? Can we actually make music ministry anti-racist? We're going to try. Okay, I think here we are probably all well aware of the United Church's efforts to make the language of our hymns less gendered and less militaristic. There are important considerations these are important considerations because both patriarchy and militarism often are differentially employed, deployed against people of color and thus are intertwined with white supremacy. It would be great if we could remove all those vestiges from our worship language through strong alternative texts or alternate texts. Efforts to provide alternate texts to replace colonial imagery continue. And we've heard about that this morning. Um, <clears throat> Voices United Collection introduced hymns from cultures beyond North America and a variety of musical styles, and that was augmented in more voices to support the belief that there are many musical ways to worship God and to recognize the diversity of God's people. In the ongoing process of developing hymnary for the United Church of Canada, we are intentional about anti-racism, which means remaining vigilant about language concerns for gender, nationalistic and militaristic images in some texts, and in offering hymns in other languages and from other parts of the world, including providing characters for Asian languages so that it's no longer just a phonetic um, text translation, but the actual characters will be there for people who read that language. Um, 
Okay. These are important steps, but if we don't understand why we're taking these steps, and we just go through the motions of singing a song in Spanish once in a while, we run the risk of that coming across as performative in the negative sense of being just for show or to make ourselves look good. Simply singing Sia Humba every once in a while doesn't constitute anti-racism. <clears throat> in fact, the occasional insertion of a hymn from another cultural group is tokenistic. It's tied to exoticism. It's an attempt to spice up our worship by including something different, right? If we use a song from another part of the world only as a special event, we are neither expanding the congregation's repertoire or thinking, nor are we supporting anti-racist initiatives. In fact, occasional use may actually reify existing stereotypes about a people and their music rather than eroding white supremacy. Occasional use merely upholds the power dynamics of white supremacy by making room for the exotic or the different. The power and the privilege involved in who can make those decisions to make room remains intact. Now, if you listen to the news from the United States, you're aware that critical race theory has come under attack over the past couple of years. And I just, as a race theorist, I just want to say it's completely misrepresented. So don't listen to what you hear about it. Uh, it's led to some politicians leading to banning books and rewriting history. One of the main tenets, though, of critical race theory is the need for marginalized persons to be able to tell their stories, to be able to share their experiences as a way of telling their truths, thus providing a counter-narrative to dominant ideologies. This is a key element of truth and reconciliation commissions. To hear the stories of people whose voices have been silenced through other legal channels, to accept those stories as real history, and to use those stories to inspire change. When we sing songs with a justice message, we put forward both a subversive act of resistance and a clarion call for a new way to be in the world. Songs can give expression to dissent, can offer protest against unjust systems, and they help to shape the collective identity of people who participate in social and political movements. When your church routinely sings songs of resistance, you announce to the world that you stand for those who are oppressed and marginalized, and your congregation may begin to identify as part of the movement toward justice, and this is performativity in the original sense that I was speaking of. Because of music's potency, however, we have to pay close attention to the way we think about and represent both God and people in our worship settings. Now, we've also discovered that issues of othering exist in many of the hymns that we currently have in our collection. You run across it in terminology such as the poor, the blind, the lame. I'm thinking of, uh, of 4,000 tongues, you know, the lame will leap. Um, when we put the, the article the in front of something, in front of a noun <clears throat> or a group identifier, we call out and other those groups of people who may live in less than optimal economic circumstances or who have an identified disability. And when hymn texts categorize people with the article the, that actually, that text itself actually engages our need to stereotype, to put things into chunk. So chunks, as soon as you say the, somebody or other, we make some assumptions that are incorrect. We're, we're basically saying that all the people that we're labeling as the are all the same, 
They all think the same, look the same, act the same. And that they're only that, that they can't be more than that. And then the categorization totally disregards all the wonderful ways that people are all multiple and that we identify in many, many ways as a single person that can't be summed up in one word. And finally, when you label somebody as a the, there's an implied deficiency, right? That somehow being in the the group makes you less than. Framing a group of people as deficient calls up a variety of emotions, ranging from the most negative, hatred, to less overtly negative feelings such as pity or empathy, but all of these emotions invoke the us and them binary, leading us to think such things as, oh God, thank God I don't have to deal with that. That poor person, what they must live through. We've all thought it, right? Okay. Sometimes this comes across in texts that seek to help the unfortunate. And that's a tactic that denies the agency of those people themselves, right? And it also leaves the privilege of the singer who's doing the singing about helping, it leaves their privilege untouched. I have, I can do this because I can. I have five minutes here, I'll help, you know? And that makes me good for the next week or month. Because of stereotyping and associated negative connotations, a person who themselves might identify as someone in that the group, who's being asked to sing those words, is probably going to feel excluded or humiliated or even ashamed. So how do we go about changing that? I'm going to offer a few suggestions now for your consideration, and then hopefully we can think about this in greater depth collectively um, <clears throat> during discussion. And let me just say that in making these recommendations, I'm really absolutely fully aware of the difficulties surrounding their implementation. But I ask you all to remember that racism is deeply entrenched in our society and in our church's history, and it is going to take sustained effort to make inroads towards dismantling white supremacy and decolonizing our theologies. So here are some guidelines. First, study the background of the music you intend to bring into a worship setting. And I'm talking not just the hymns, although that's, you know, a huge focus, but think about the, you know, the solo pieces, the, the occasional music that occurs. Um, you know, is it off message to what else is going on, right? Know the history. Uh, does the, the hymn or the anthem have colonial underpinnings? Was it written by someone who who behaved very badly, and we don't want to represent that music any longer. Um, if the song, maybe it doesn't have, if a song text isn't overtly racist in its, or patriarchal or othering in the lyrics, and you might say, okay, this is good to go, but as Brianna Clover reminds us, we also have to consider the author of the lyrics, the social dynamics of the era in which the song was written, and from whose perspective was it written? The dominant culture or the marginalized? And once, we've known, once we have a handle on those things, we can make an informed decision about whether that piece should be in our worship. Because as we know, music conveys messages both overtly and subliminally. 
If there's a chance that a music's tune or text may be considered oppressive, if it hints at us and them, I'd suggest that if you truly want to be anti-racist, just don't use it. If you're not sure, find something else. Because, golly gosh, we've got a wealth of material to choose from. And if this means retiring some of your congregation's favorite hymns or anthems, well, Long and McQuaid will sell you some new stuff, I'm sure. <laughs> Find alternate, alternate hymn texts whenever you can. You know, some of, some of what we still have in Voices United, the committee is working to, to make some continued adjustments, but, uh, you know, if you know that something is, is representing uh, coloniality or militarism or something that we don't want to represent, then try to find another text. Maybe you can write a text for your congregation. Bruce Harding in the songwriting session yesterday suggested that. So take a tune you love. Try your hand at, at creating a text that's suitable for your situation. Um, <clears throat> don't be afraid to try new songs that have been written with a concern for avoiding various issues, particularly racism and colonialism. Now, <clears throat> here's the, a big one. I'm not going to talk about cultural appropriation. Becca did a great job talking about that this morning, and what I had prepared kind of doubled that, so I'll, I'll just move on from that a little bit. Other than to say, we, we do need to be really careful that the music we use, that the proceeds for its use are going to the appropriate people. But at the same time as I say that, I have so often heard people use cultural appropriation as the excuse to not try. I'm afraid I'll butcher it. I don't want to be disrespectful. Okay, that's legitimate. Do your homework. Do some study. Find out what the song is about. Find out what the performance standards are. If you're not sure of the language, find somebody to coach you in it. Uh, listen to YouTube examples or Smithsonian folkways and, and get a handle on the music. And when you're confident to teach it, teach it. Yes, you'll make mistakes. I'm getting ahead of myself. But please don't use the fear of cultural appropriation as a, as a barrier for you doing this work. Um, <clears throat> we did hear also how this morning we're, uh, the United Church is reassigning copyrights to ensure ethical uh, use of hymns and to redirect proceeds um, to people whose music actually, where it, where it actually came and to try to get the uh, capitalistic piece of this back into the right hands. Um, okay. Representation and redistribution of... Oop, did I... No, I'm way, way off my game. Okay. Okay. Um, representation and the redistrib redistribution of racial power. Who does the singing or provides leadership is a really important consideration in anti-racism. The redistribution of resources is key to dismantling white supremacy, and it requires divesting power and privilege so that people of color can take leadership over aspects of worship, including music. The result may be that they do things really differently than it's been done. And in the church, you know, it's like, well, it's been this way for 110 years. We can't change it now. Maybe we need to change it now, right? Um, when they do things a little differently, people will be uncomfortable. It's a guarantee. But it's through that discomfort. That discomfort is necessary for learning and for growth. 
and especially in learning to be fully accepting of each other as humans. Um, when we're representing, when we bring in people to share leadership with us, and we sing for justice, that's something we can rejoice together about. We want to make sure these folks are compensated adequately. That was also discussed this morning. When we pay people, it not only supports them economically, but when they are in leadership roles in worship, it sends a very powerful anti-racist message without you having to say much else, right? Okay, using original languages whenever it's possible to do so. Remember earlier I talked about the sound waves enter our body? Well, this is one of the reasons why singing in the original language is really important, because those sound waves are dependent on how the sounds are formed and in combination with pitch, right? So when we sing in the original language, we begin to get at, and I'm not saying we understand, but we begin to get at how that, sound, how that song may have landed with those people when they sang it, right? And it gives us a way to, to think about worship from a different perspective, through those different sounds. So I, I'm big on singing in other languages, and yes, we stumble, we trip our tongues over them. It's, it's not an easy thing to do, and it takes some patience and persistence. So if you're not multilingual or you have trouble with other languages, I encourage you to find someone in your community who can coach you, who perhaps can actually teach the text to your congregation. If you don't have somebody that you can draw on to help in that way, there are so many free examples. Thing, you can get so much for free on the internet, right? Through YouTube, through resources like Smithsonian Folkways, through various language programs. Um, so, you know, make sure that you feel if you need support, get the support. If you can't have someone to come in and help you with this hands-on, do your research and study. And do the best you can. Now, when we do this, when we bring in these other elements into worship, we need to let our congregations understand why we're doing it. So sometimes we have to, you know, pro provide some education. Maybe you do it through bulletin notes. Maybe you do it with a little five-minute talk before you introduce a new piece. Give the cultural context, as Becca did this morning. How did we come to the song? How did, why does the United Church have this song as something they feel we should be singing? Whatever you can do to set a receptive state of mind for your congregants, I encourage you to do that uh, because it really is important that we begin to expand what we do in worship to really make the statement that we believe everyone is welcome here and that we are all children of God. And finally, be patient with yourself, with your congregation, be forgiving of their mistakes, of your mistakes. And as I said earlier, I realize that this is a very hard thing to be, to enact week after week after week after week. To go through all of this for every single song that you do, that's a lot. Um, you can't do it all at once. I don't think anybody in their right mind would try to do it all at once. So you might want to think about creating a timeline for yourself, how, you know, and, and try to schedule it in so that you know that you're ready to, to push your congregation a little further, 
to learn something new. They get this under their belt pretty comfortably. Add something else, add something else. Be prepared for their reactions, gauge their reactions. If they love something great, you're golden. They won't always. They might actually be kind of nasty about it. And then you have to really think about, okay, was that the right piece of music? Is there something else that can do the same thing that they might respond to better? And this is why there's no checklist for this, because every situation is individual, right? But you can expect there to be some pushback. And when that happens, your job is to be persistent. Know why you've done it so that you can explain that to them. Maybe they'll understand, hopefully they'll understand. They may still not like it, but if you keep at it, they'll know that, you know, this is the way it's going to be. And uh, hopefully, eventually, they'll get on board with it, right? I've been told by a lot of anti-racist workers, activists, professors, teachers, that if we don't get pushback, we're not doing it right. Right? So, uh, this, is, this is a big task for us, but we've got the tool. We've got the best tool, I think, to do this. So, we keep in mind that this is our mandate. The National Church wa wants us to do this work and it's really necessary to be truly faithful people of God, then we, hope, we muster up our courage and we persist. I still think of Elizabeth Warren, and yet she persisted. You know, That has to be all of us. Okay, so some final thoughts as I wrap up. Adele Halliday advises that the realization that racism exists in the church can be surprising even upsetting for people. But to move toward becoming truly anti-racist, all of us, racialized persons and white people, need to ask, what does it mean for you in your life? If you are someone who has benefited from racism, now what? What's your next action? In our context as United Church musicians, we can ask ourselves how our work needs to be refocused to dismantle white supremacy and to work against the entrenchment of racism in our worship music. Keep asking yourself, what is your motivation for this work? Is it to, whoops, yeah, <clears throat> sorry about that. Is it to increase the diversity of your congregation? Is it? I'm going to suggest that if that is your motivation, that's not probably where you need to be. It may seem like a worthy goal, and obviously we would all welcome seeing diverse faces in our midst. But if we think that just singing Sia Humba or a South African freedom song is going to bring other folks in, we are deluding ourselves because that will be read as performative in the negative sense. It's the token thing we're doing to look good, right? So we need to, we need to realize that this is all of a piece, right? And when we, if we're going to sing justice, if all we do is sing, it may stand as an empty gesture. But if we can combine it with our works in the church, with our outreach, with our support for various uh, communities around us, and we make our entire orientation justice, then it all fits together and it feels genuine. And that's the funny thing about performativity, even the false kind, because what we, if we sing something enough times, it does begin to sink into our psyches. And so if we're intentional with our musical selections, when we bring them fully into our congregation's repertoire so that it no longer represents something special and becomes a normal part of our worship, 
it's possible that the effort will actually become truly performative in that original sense. As we learn to love these songs, and when we understand why they are important pieces of our worship, they can inspire us to action. And when that happens, we begin to understand what Christopher Small actually meant when he wrote, how we like to music is who we are. Through our anti-racist song, we begin to sing and believe that we are all people of God. Thank you. So I hope we've got some time for questions. That went a little longer than I thought it was going to. But. Absolutely. If, if we have any questions, just... Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, you started this by saying we often plan worship based on you know seasonal uh, uh, specific topics for a Sunday, okay, uh, uh, because we're going to do an Indigenous Day or um, uh, um, special day for Black uh, Black Heritage, whatever. And that's I guess where the danger of tokenism comes in as I'm following across there. So um, to try to avoid that. Is it possible to say have a a full, like say this year our church is going to focus on uh, uh, trying to understand a little bit more about this particular culture, and then throughout the year presenting you know some material based on that that will help to help us to understand. I don't know. I'm just trying to avoid the the tokenism that I know I fall into many times. It's, it's very hard to avoid the tokenistic thing, and, and there are so many requirements in the church calendar, right, that, that make it a little hard to, to do this with the kind of intention we might want to do it with. Um, but I like the idea of going deep into a single culture, and maybe over, I mean, in curriculum, in, in education, you know, that's often the way you do it. You, you, uh, don't try to travel the whole world in one year or one semester, right? You go deep into one particular region or culture, and then the next year you address something else, right? So maybe you specialize, you know? But I, I think my main point is, you know, don't just sing a South African freedom song during Black History Month and never sing it again during the rest of the year, right? Um, because that is absolutely tokenistic and performative in the, the oh, aren't we special? <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. That's, that's good. A good approach. Anyone else? I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but... Thank you very much. Uh, that was really stimulating. I just wanted to get a bit of clarification on your example of... Um, William Blake's Jerusalem and mm -hmm. the traditional setting and then the, the contrast you made with, um, with Dodd's setting of O Day of Peace. Is it your assertion that we haven't gone far enough in the text because people are being, to use the language of trauma, triggered by some of the words in the original Blake text? Or, or we need to keep singing. Uh, yeah, I think we're in that space where there are still people who, for whom the original text was what they grew up with. Right, so I think we're probably a couple of generations away from that text being out of our hearts and minds. I mean, I love the, the Carl Daw text, I do. But um, I think we either need to keep singing that and explain why we don't sing Jerusalem here, um, and also keep looking for other texts. I mean, there is also a, a world of God in Voices United, which is to the same tune and, and says something different than O Day of Peace. So, um, you know, we have to work to try to remove those images. Or if we're going to use, I mean, and there's there's case to be made for some kinds of settings where you actually would sing Jerusalem and then use that as your teaching moment to point out the colonialism and the militarism embedded in that song. 
you know, but you wouldn't necessarily want to do that on a Sunday morning, I don't think. I think that's more of a study group situation or, or special service of some kind. Here, ministers often intercessing, say, so for example, often we have expressions in the Bible for fear of the Jews, right? And often a very sensitive minister will say, well, you know, we all know Jesus was Jewish or that was just the uh, authorities. So when you use words like swords, you know, in sort of neuro-linguistic programming, they talk a lot about reframing. So taking a loaded word like swords and then saying, you know, we're, we're going to lay down those swords. Because um, I don't know, I, I think some of the things that I struggle with personally is that when we, there's also, a, a, you know, this idea of text underlay, so that the power of text underlay. Sometimes when we, re, when we, when we make new wordings, it's, there's something missing in, in how we do it. And, and also then, you know, when you take a tune like Jerusalem Perry, one, one of the great tunes with the perfect arch shape, it's, mm -hmm. it's, there's also an aesthetic tradition on the musical side that we're trying to preserve for our choirs and for our our mm -hmm. congregation, so I don't know, there's... I don't know that there's a right answer, okay. right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a thorny problem, yeah, you sure. know? We're aware now. We weren't aware even mm -hmm. 30 years ago, right? And what do we do with that awareness, and how do we make changes that we think are going to, to get us where we hope to be? This is all aspirational, by the way, right? You know, this is, uh, I, I don't think any of us are, will ever get there completely, but it's, it's something to try for. Thank you very much. You're welcome. What do you think? No? I think we're good. I, there, I see another hand, but. That's it. I think. Yeah, yeah. Thank thank you all so much. Yeah. Thank you.